for the last two weeks, I participated in a machine learning for biology hackathon. And it was one of the craziest, hardest, and honestly funnest things that I've done in a long while. And I want to tell you about it because I want you to try something like this. So the hackathon was called Evolved. And to get into it, you needed at least five people on your team and only 20 teams were going to be selected. So right off the bat, I didn't think I had a chance. I was very doubtful that I could convince four other people to try and do this with me. And plus, even if I did, I'm not a biologist and I have no professional experience in machine learning. So what chance would we have of even getting through the selection process? So even though I really wanted to enter, I couldn't. But on the day that the application was due, I mentioned this to a friend who's a machine learning engineer. And he said, why not? I'll join your team. And then a few of my other friends said, yeah, sure, that sounds like fun. So in the end, the team consisted of a couple of ML people, a couple of software engineers, and a couple of physicists. So we scrambled to put together a proposal and submitted it just in time. I'm glad I didn't know this at the time, but there were over 1,200 applicants to this hackathon. And a Nature article about ML hackathons in biology called this particular hackathon the standout. I wouldn't have applied if I knew. I wouldn't have bothered. Most of the people who got through were super impressive and obviously experts in the field. And then there was our ragtag team. But somehow the judges liked our application and by some crazy luck, we got through. It was a 10 day hackathon, but the problem we chose to work on was unlike anything that any of us had worked on before. So the learning curve was steep. I'm so grateful to the team who sorted out the pretty complicated data processing pipeline and also to our ML engineers who sorted out everything for us to be able to run this code on eight GPUs in the cloud, as well as, you know, creating the, the Docker container and all of that. The task of writing the model though fell to me and it was intense. Nothing I tried seemed to work and I tried everything. Our gradients kept vanishing and our losses were flatlining. In the last four days, I barely slept. As soon as I sent a model off to the cloud for evaluation, I needed to rip up the code and write something brand new to try when the current one would inevitably fail. Weights and biases said that in those last days, we ran over 50 models. The night before it was all due, I was desperate. Nothing had come close to working yet and the losses were looking terrible. So I gave it one last go and I wrote a new model. I realized that what we really needed was something like a cross-attention mechanism, but with way less parameters. So I wrote something, sent it off, and that night I also barely slept because I was watching weights and biases in disbelief as our losses dropped. I was so relieved. There was a lot we could have and really should have done from this point, but we just ran out of time. And so of course we didn't win, but the judges gave us some really kind feedback saying that they liked our project and most importantly, we learned a lot from doing this. I'm so glad that we didn't count ourselves out before this even started. Like, yes, no doubt, if we had more of a background in biology and chemistry, we would have made some things so much better. So I'm not discounting the importance of being an expert in this field. But I think it is an exciting time where people outside of the field are also able to contribute in meaningful ways. For example, AlphaFold won the Nobel Prize while we were working on this hackathon. So maybe you should join this hackathon too next year. Links are in the description. If you're interested in what our project actually was, here's the video we submitted for judging. The problem we worked on during this hackathon was set by Invita, a company who focuses on identifying drug-like molecules from plants. But the problem is, when you extract an unknown molecule from a plant, how do you figure out what it is? That's where tandem mass spectroscopy comes in, where you take that molecule and you bombard it and break it up into little fragments. And then you put these fragments into a mass spectrometer and you can get the mass divided by charge ratio for each of the fragments, as well as an intensity that tells you how common certain fragment types are. So this is what a spectra would look like. Now, our problem was to basically do the reverse problem of this. So we had a data set with 1 million examples of identified molecules like this one, and then the spectra that actually came out during experiments or in silico. 
and we had to try and make a model that would be able to solve this problem in general. When you put in a molecule here that we know, what does the spectra look like? Our idea was that we have a million data points, but we can kind of augment that with Kemberta. So the Kemberta model is a pre-trained model for chemistry that was trained on about a million molecules. Now, Kemberta itself knows nothing really about mass spectroscopy, but our idea was we would put the molecule into Kemberta and then take the output from Kemberta and put it into a couple of final layers and output um, a mass spectrum. And so these final layers would be the ones responsible for outputting the spectra, but Kemberta would use its general knowledge about how molecules work, and that would be a useful starting point. Now, the problem though is that Kemberta is huge. So there are 44 million parameters inside of Kemberta. Directly fine tuning this was out of the question, but we decided to do a LoRa fine tuning, which brought the number of tunable parameters inside of Kemberta down to about 0.5 million. However, we still had a huge problem where the output of Kemberta is also really massive. So for every part of this molecule, you get a vector which has length 768. And so if there's 512 parts of that molecule, which is the maximum, then you already have around 400,000 parameters just to describe the output. And if this final layers just does a really, really simple, like one linear layer thing to try and get 10 fragments, this would already make this an 8 million parameter model which we didn't think was trainable with the amount of data we had. The idea was we needed to somehow compress all of that information that came from Kemberta. So a very common way that this is done is just to take the average. You literally just add all of these vectors. But doing that didn't, well, firstly, isn't conceptually very nice. And secondly, didn't really lead to very good results. We tried over 20 different models, by the way. Um, all with very different architectures, and yeah, most of them didn't work well. So averaging didn't work well. There was an intriguing idea called intention pooling, where instead of just taking the average, you kind of decide by looking into each of the vectors in here, which of these are the most interesting, and then you weigh the most interesting ones a little bit more heavily, and then you average. But we still didn't like the idea of this, because Basically, each of these tokens inside of Kemberta represents a part of the molecule. And we didn't like the idea of just compressing all of that down into a single thing at the end. It felt more natural to compress it down instead into sort of fragments. So maybe these fragments go together and then those could go together, that sort of thing. So for this, it seemed more natural to use sort of a cross attention mechanism. And we did try that, but we found that it was way, way too big. It was about 5 million parameters. But theoretically, that was more what we were going for. So we came up with a, I think, novel mechanism that we called multi-query attention pooling. So it's very similar to the attention pooling here, where you look into each of the um, parts of the molecule and decide how much to weigh them. But instead of just doing it once, we do it for each possible fragment. And so each fragment kind of decides which parts of the molecule it wants in it. This isn't the same as just like regular attention, which required about 5 million parameters, because this only required about 0.5 million parameters. So it's quite efficient. And this was by far the model that trained the best. So let's look at some results from it. So you can see that the results do look a little bit all over the place, because there's heaps and heaps of predicted spikes uh, but the reason for that is because our loss function doesn't at the moment penalize predicting too many things. And so it makes sense for the model to hedge its bets by putting loads and loads of spikes around. But our idea was to, after training this model, to take it from this checkpoint and put in a more aggressive loss function that does penalize loads of fragments. We just <laughs> ran out of time to be able to do that because of the number of models that we ended up training. So that would be something we'd really, really want to do in the future. But you can see that this model does kind of get the right regions for the main peaks. And here, although it misses this one. 
Okay, so future work, obviously we'd like to train that a little bit more, but another idea we had was to train a model that was completely different. This one is using both GraphMS, which is NVIDIA's state-of-the-art model, and then also Converter. So the idea with GraphMS is to use the molecule as if it's a graph. So each uh, atom is a node and each bond is a edge and then use that graph structure to update the molecule. And so each node and edge gets its own hidden vector. And these are initialized in a certain way, but more or less randomly. And our idea was that instead of initializing each of these randomly, we use the embedding that comes from Camberta. And then we run the graph MS algorithm. So we wrote a lot of the code for this model, but because it was over 10 million parameters, we didn't try to actually train this model. But that's something we'd be really excited about doing in the future and something that we're gonna keep working on. Thanks so much for considering our submission.